Good evening, everybody, um, and welcome along to our webinar panel session on some of the emerging evidence for the Greater Cambridge Local Plan. Um, my name is Paul Brainer. I'm Assistant Director for Strategy and Economy at the Greater Cambridge Planning Service. Um, I'm just going to do a little bit of a intro and housekeeping for everybody, and then we'll get straight into the session. So we've got about an hour. Um, the topics around for you as the public and people who have arrived to see us to share some of the information that we've been working through and developing over the last few months on the Greater Cambridge Local Plan and kind of give you a bit of a heads up on what we've been doing and give you a chance to answer some questions. Um, it's not a formal consultation, it's just a good practice really. We promised we'd be transparent and try and share things as they were coming out and we felt this was a good time to share some of those thoughts as they were published for our committee groups as well. Um, the actual formal consultation stage, for those of you who are interested, will be back in the summer 2021, which seems a long way away from now, but in our team, I think that's coming up pretty soon. Um, so it's an hour long. The webinar tonight is being recorded. I have had a few Wi-Fi issues, so if I do drop out, my, one of us in the team will tag team and try and get this uh, get it seamlessly across to you. Um, you can post anonymously, please. There's no chat function. You have to use the Q&A, but you can post anonymously or you can choose to use your names. We won't read out your names when we do the Q&A. So there's one slide presentation, which is about 15 minutes long, followed by a 15 minute Q&A, and then another slide presentation, which is about 10 minutes, followed by another 10 minute Q&A. So that's the format. Um, I'm going to introduce our presenters stroke panelists today we've got a few of the team here some of our experts on some of the work that's been going on um, and I'll let them introduce themselves and then we'll crack on with the session so I'm going to first go to you Hannah. Hi my name's Hannah Loftus I'm the lead for engagement and communications with the shared planning service. Thank you Hannah. Stuart. Hi my name's Stuart Morris I'm a principal planner in the policy strategy and economy team for the Great Cambridge shared planning service. Thank you, Stuart. We'll go to John. Hi, uh, John Dixon, Planning Policy Manager, uh, working on the local plan. Cheers, John. Caroline? Hello, I'm Caroline Hunt. I'm Strategy and Economy Manager, working alongside John on the local plan. Thank you, Caroline. And uh, last but not least, Nadine. Good evening, I'm Nadine Din, I'm the Local Plan Project Manager in the Planning Service. Cheers Nadine, we've got Jo Burnham up in the corner as well, she's helping us run things tonight um, from the tech side of things um, so, and help running the chat. So I'm going to hand over to Hannah who's going to present us some slides and we can get on with the webinar. Thanks everybody. So we're just going to take you through a little bit of background, first of all, um, and just talk about the stage we're at. Um, so, oops, sorry, apologies, that went a bit faster than intended. Just to clarify where we are at at the local plan preparation, as Paul outlined, we're in between the first conversation consultation that happened earlier this year um, and the preferred options public consultation, which will be um, around the middle autumn of next year. So at this point in time, we've just published some initial evidence findings, and this is part of some stakeholder engagement that we are doing um, over the next couple of weeks. Um, and we wanted to just share that with the public as well, so that you're all cited on the kind of evidence that is coming out at this point in time um, and what it might mean for the plan going forward. Just to recap that um, we are structuring the, the local plan around some of the big themes that we consulted on in the function and in, in the um, first conversation. Um, and there was a really strong support in the consultation responses for those big themes in terms of a, a way of structuring and understanding what's important about the area going forward. Um, and what was really interesting was that climate change was definitely the highest priority with well-being and social inclusion as a second. And I think that really helps us frame what we're trying to do with the plan, which is balance. How do we meet the needs of our communities in terms of jobs, homes, affordable homes and other things to do with well-being alongside the climate change emergency that both councils have declared um, and our need to get to net zero carbon. 
the plan obviously takes place in a wider context, which we're very aware of and talking to many partners regionally and nationally about that, including the Oxcam Arc and East West Rail. Um, and then of course the background of the city deal, which um, brings in a lot of investment based on supporting growth, which is identified in our adopted local plans. And of course, the work that the combined authority is also doing. So we're very mindful of that context and some of the evidence that you'll be hearing about also talks about some of those wider issues. It's very important that this, the local plan that we come up with is, is what is known in the technical terminology as sound. That basically means that it passes the tests that are set for us by the national planning framework that we are required to work within. It, the, those four points are here on the slide, which are to be positively prepared, which means that we need to have objectively assessed the need for development in our area and meet that as a minimum. It needs to be justified, so we need to have looked at reasonable alternatives. We can't just go to one solution without having looked at what the alternatives are. And it needs to be effective, which means that we can actually achieve it in practice. And of course, it has to be consistent with national policy. So during this last stage, since the first conversation, we've been doing an awful lot of work to gather and analyze a range of baseline data and also start to explore what some of those reasonable alternatives and different options might be. So we've commissioned a range of, of evidence-based consultants to work with us. Um, and we have also calculated the minimum requirement according to the government standard method, which is essentially a, a formula for how much housing uh, the, how the, the area may be considered to need as a minimum. We've also looked at future economic growth and what that might look like if it was faster. Um, and those are some figures that Caroline will go through in a minute. And then what housing levels might be needed to support that. We looked at a range of broad locations for new development and those are very deliberately diverse. So this is not about um, saying that any one of those locations is the strategy that the eventual plan might have. It's about testing what are the implications of different sorts of approaches for locating development. And what this stage is really about is then testing that against some of the emerging evidence. So asking those specialists to tell us, well, in regard to net zero carbon or water or any of these other matters, how well do each of those locations perform? What are the pros and cons? And that's really about helping ourselves and our elected members and councillors here decide on what the preferred strategy may be going forward. So we've published this all on our website and we'll show the website details at the end of this for your records. Um, and it really is about being transparent with us. We want to help everybody test this. And we, are, we have been holding and are continuing to hold a series of workshops for representatives from different stakeholder groups to get some more detailed input from them. I'm now gonna hand over to Caroline who will start talking about the growth level options that we've been looking at. Thank you, Hannah. Um, a key part of any plan is to consider what the future needs for its area is for the homes and for jobs, the infrastructure that supports it. Um, and, and we've set out those overarching themes that will be the, um, the, the lens through which we look. Um, but looking first at, uh, at the issue of, of homes and jobs, um, national policy uh, from government tells us that we must use a standard method to calculate the minimum number of homes that are uh, needed for our area. Um, and we wanted also to then understand the number of jobs that would be supported by that number of homes. But as Hannah said, we've also commissioned evidence to look at um, future job growth potential in this area, recognising that the Greater Cambridge area is, is, is nationally and in fact internationally significant in terms of economic growth, particularly around the uh, um, high tech and, and, and uh, life science sectors. Um, and there's been really fast growth in, uh, in recent times. In fact, over the last 10 years, we've delivered, it looks from data to be almost the, uh, a significant proportion of the growth that we anticipated coming over 20 years in our current adopted plans. Um, and the evidence is suggesting that there will be continued strong growth in those key sectors. So we wanted to understand that if there is potential for uh, future jobs growth in the area, what would be the number of homes that would need to sit alongside that 
um, to make sure that we are providing for a sustainable form of development in this area. And, and that's led us to, um, through that evidence, identifying some potential growth levels. Um, so we, in the table on the screen, you can see that we have benchmarked that against our current adopted plans. Um, and the minimum level of uh, housing growth is, is a little more than we've been delivering per annum in our current plans um, in terms of homes, um, but actually would be a reduction in the delivery of jobs into the, into the future. Looking at the medium level, our economic forecast suggests that this is the most likely outcome taking account of long-term historic growth over the last 10, 20 years um, or more. Uh, to us take account of the fast growth there's been in key sectors in the recent past, uh, but it does take that longer term trend thinking about the, check, the, the economic cycles that we inevitably go through. Um, and that gives us a medium level of growth that we've looked at in uh, testing reasonable options. And then it does look at potential for actually if the fast growth over the last five, 10 years in these key sectors were to continue, uh, what might that look like in terms of jobs growth? And then we've looked to understand what that looks like in terms of homes to sit alongside it. And thinking about the supply of land for bringing forward jobs and homes. Um, on the job side, we already have quite a significant supply of employment land that goes um, some way towards meeting um, even some of the higher jobs uh, forecasts uh, here. Um, and then on the housing side, um, we have already quite a significant supply of homes within our current plans. Uh, Hannah, could you go to the next slide, please? Um, thank you. Uh, and our current plans include significant amounts of development. So that includes a number of new settlements, for example, like at Norstow or Water Beach and so on, where we always knew they were sites that were going to de deliver well beyond our adopted plans to 2031 and actually potentially beyond even the new plan to 2041. And when you take that all into account, we've got over 36,000 homes in the pipeline based on our current um, assessments, but uh, uh, that's obviously something we'll need to keep under review. It's also important that our plan is capable of adapting to rapid change. Um, and to do that, we've included a 10% buffer on those numbers that uh, you saw on the previous screen. So when you look at that together, that suggests that um, in terms of additional housing that needs to be allocated in the new plan, uh, that ranges from about 4,000 for the minimum, around 10,000 for the median, and uh, um, around 26,000 for the maximum. So quite a range there in the amount of homes that we need to find. But I think it is important to think about in the context of the overall supply we already have. And you can see that graphically there. Um, so a significant amount of supply already. And it depends which of the growth levels we look at as to how much more we need to find. One further point that is uh, important to think about here. So if all local authorities across the country deliver against this government standard method, cal way of calculating homes, then it, it, it assumes pretty much that the same sort of pattern of movements between where people live and where they work would just continue into the future and wouldn't have uh, potential consequences um, for, for further growth beyond that. Um, where though we're testing options that do look for higher level of growth, um, for the, uh, 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 within the area. Um, for the medium level, we've, uh, we, we've looked at if the potential same pattern of development were to continue, uh, what does that mean for our neighbors, for us or our neighbors? And it, it's potentially another 2,400 homes over the standard uh, method. And for the maximum, it would be 3,000 over the standard method. And there are different ways that could be dealt with. It could be that Greater Cambridge provides all of those, 
or it could be that our neighbours do or some pattern in between. So we've been very transparent about the implications of the different growth levels for the area. And then lastly from me, um, it's really important at this point to recognise that we're in a un unprecedented times. Um, we've been talking about Brexit for many years and what impact that could have, but obviously COVID and the pandemic now, we know it's having an immediate impact on, uh, on the way people, uh, where people work and, and commuting and so on. But we're really at the heart of it now and it's still difficult to tell what the long-term predictions might be. So we will very much keep that under review as we go through our plan as more information becomes available. And so for example, I think there's a sense that a lot of people are now working at home and does, what does that mean for employment lands and also for tra travel and traffic. Um, nationally, uh, recent information that only about a quarter of workers were working exclusively from home uh, even with the severe restrictions in place in October. So uh, we'll, we'll really have to look and see how that plays out over time and what impact it would have on our plan. Um, I'm now going to hand over to John to take you through some of the other evidence findings that we uh, so far uh, identified. So local plans are supported by an awful lot of evidence behind the reasoning behind the policies and helping develop really what the plan needs to uh, address and, and how it might go about addressing it. And at this stage, we've published some of the initial findings of that evidence um, that we've done so far, uh, particularly looking at the evidence relating to um, the impact of some of the, the growth numbers choices that Caroline's just run through and also some of the spatial choices, which I come on to talk about later. Just to highlight um, a few of the studies which really have some uh, important um, evidence relating to those numbers, we've commissioned a study specifically looking at um, how our local plan can contribute to uh, the journey towards uh, net zero carbon. It's a big issue for both councils. Uh, it's looked at what the different implications of where you put homes might have for carbon. And that could be looking at the, their carbon generated from uh, the construction of the homes themselves, uh, the carbon generated by the users of those dwellings. So when you're using energy in the home, for example, and also the energy used uh, in transport. And what it really shows is while through policies, you can certainly reduce the amount of carbon generated by the users of future dwellings, there'll still be some impacts from transport. And those impacts vary depending on where you are and in particular what access you have to sustainable forms of transport and that difference can be as much as three times in terms of the much carbon depending on you whether you're in a fairly um, not connected by public transport um, village location for example compared with being in an urban area so there's some quite significant differences there's lots of charts uh, and in and diagrams in the study uh, which you can see on our website but I'll come on to later showing some of the spatial choices we've tested and that chart really shows some of the differences you get between uh, those different spatial choices when you look at how much carbon per home they might generate. And the next chart shows how you might compare the amount of carbon overall. So particularly interesting on the left hand side of that chart, it shows the amount of carbon being generated from our well existing developments, the existing districts as they are now. Moving across to the right, it shows us much smaller bar chart showing um, the amount of carbon generated by the growth already in our pipelines. And then, in the more colourful bit towards the right, it starts to compare uh, the growth choices we've been testing, those amounts of growth looking minimum, medium, maximum. And business as usual, it's referring to building dwellings in the way we do now. And the zero carbon would be, zero carbon policies would be what if you can impose those policies which try to deal with the carbon generated by the use of the dwellings, but it would still leave carbon generated by transport. And that's really what it's showing, those different choices um, that we have available, and how they might generate carbon. We're also aware that water issues are very important to our local community. And, re and reflecting that, we commissioned a significant study looking at all sorts of water issues related to the plan. And it particularly looked at water supply issues. 
it's quite clear in that study there's no longer capacity uh, in the chalk aquifers, which serve much of our water needs to supply growth that we plan through this new local plan. Water supply needs to be dealt with by balancing supplies by being more efficient with the way we use for water and also looking at water from um, sustainable sources. Whilst for the minimum growth option, uh, it's certainly capable of being accommodated in, in, in current supplies. It becomes much more challenging for the higher growth levels and indeed the study refers for the maximum growth option as it being a deal breaker. There is potentially a water available, particularly looking at through regional scale interventions such as reservoirs, for example. But because of the timing of those in current normal ways you deliver water infrastructure, they won't be available until the mid 2030s. So that would have impact on how you could deliver those high growth options unless you can find a way of delivering them more quickly. And then we've also commissioned a study looking at housing delivery because it's important we look at whether the homes we plan for that they can actually be delivered to meet the needs of being, that are being identified. That shows that really we should be looking to have a balance of supply, looking at sites that can come form in both the short, medium and longer term. It highlights some of the challenges really about actually delivering the homes in those higher growth standards, both in terms of an overall number that you'd be seeking to do every year across the whole area, but also the challenges of increasing the growth rates on individual sites, which you might need to achieve those numbers. So how, how many homes can actually be sold, for example, if you build them quickly? It shows that the medium option largely is capable of doing, but it might be more challenges related to that higher option. And then just quickly to highlight some of those pros and cons again, uh, with the minimum, it's likely that you can address the water issues through appropriate policies. You can probably deliver the homes and the, but those homes targets don't necessarily respond to the evidence on the economy that, that Caroline highlighted earlier. And then on the medium, the water issues are more challenging, but can plausibly be addressed. Housing delivery can plausibly be addressed. Um, and it does respond more to those economic needs along that sort of central medium scenario. And then for the maximum, as I mentioned earlier, for water, it looks more challenging. For housing delivery, more challenging as well. And I think now we're moving on to some Q&A. Uh, many thanks, John, Caroline and Hannah. So yeah, I already see some questions coming through now. So if you want to type your questions into the Q&A function down the bottom, we'll try and work through them. Um, if we do overrun a little bit at the end, I think we're, we're okay to do that. So just quickly, I'll deal off with the first one. Because it is a webinar session, um, it, you have to ask through the Q&A function rather than um, ask questions vocally. Um, I think that's just the way that this Zoom setup particularly works for this session. Um, so I'm going to pick up the first question. Should any plans be halted and reviewed considering the changes to our economy, ways of working, where we now work in the last nine months? So I think as Caroline, I'll touch on this quickly and others can come in if they wish to. I think as Caroline touched on, we're very acutely aware of the real uncertainty, both economically, but also from a regulatory point of view. And, you know, we know that there are planning reform changes coming and changes that may well affect how we prepare a local plan. Um, the message from government at the moment, A, is that we should continue plan making. I suppose the issue is as well that we should have a current and up-to-date plan in place, otherwise we risk speculative development from developers and we want to have control over how the area looks. So we should be continuing to you know, make plans. The point of having a local plan is also that we have a five year review every every five years a plan is reviewed. So, you know, some of this evidence really and some of the work, the work around the ec economic piece, you know, won't be forthcoming. We won't see trends, you know, for far, far longer than nine months, 12 months, 18 months, because they do take some time for us to be able to uh, you know, understand them. So I suppose it's a difficult one, but we need to still collect the evidence and still continue with our plan making at this present moment in time. I don't know if anyone else wants to add into that from the panel. Okay, so we'll move on quickly. Um, in the 2018 spatial strategy, S6, you were clear that housing would come from the edge of Cambridge. In the new settlements, rural and minor rural centres, you protected the smaller villages. We are a group village, S10. Are you changing the village 
classification. So I think I'm going to hand to Caroline because she's got a lot of experience in this area. Thanks, Paul. Um, I think at this stage, it's probably a little early to say quite whether we'll be carrying forward the previous um, uh, hierarchy or, or looking to any refinement of it at all. Um, we did some consultation on, on that through the first conversation. And as we look through the responses we've received, we'll be um, considering that further. But I suppose what I would say is that with the emphasis on um, on climate change and sustainable development, we're very, we're still very mindful of um, locations that can, um, you know, respect those, those key concerns, while still recognising the social side of sustainable development too. Um, and uh, um, we're keen to understand from villages what they think their future needs are as part of our plan making process. Thanks very much, Caroline. Um, Got another one here. Please, can you clarify what you consider to be edge of Cambridge non green belt as the city is surrounded by green belt? So, um, I think I've passed to John on this, but Stuart might be helpful to answer as well on this one. So, there are two pretty significant areas uh, on the edge of Cambridge which don't form part of the green belt, which we've explored through the spatial options which I'll come on to in a minute. The first is Northeast Cambridge and you may have seen we did some consultation slightly earlier in the year on how that area might be uh, planned for. The second is the uh, Cambridge Airport site which was actually removed from the green belt ooh, about 10 years ago I could be wrong and safeguarded for uh, development. So that's no longer part of the green belt but self safeguarded for future development should it become available. So both those choices are being looked at through the spatial uh, options I'll come on to at the second part of the presentation. Thank you, John. Um, okay, let's move on to this one here. I'm going to try and pick through them as much as I can. We will get through, I should imagine, all of these um, so far. So how much brownfield land is left to use before expanding into the green belt? Who wants to pick that up? Caroline? Uh, yes, I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? So there's very little further large brownfield land left in, in, in Greater Cambridge that hasn't already been identified for development. So um, John mentioned North East Cambridge, that is one of the key last um, undeveloped brownfield sites. Um, and that is something that has been uh, looked at in, in previous plans and the councils are currently um, preparing an area action plan for that area uh, in anticipation that the water treatment works can potentially now get uh, be relocated. Uh, so that's very much the last major brownfield site um, that we've uh, we have in this area. Thank you, Caroline. Um, I'm going to answer this one as well. And there's a couple of questions or observations around the economic issues, which are actually quite helpful to, to see those. And I think, as I said before, I think that understanding that we, we know that we're in a very uncertain time economically and that, that our initial evidence base, and in fact, the work that you know, it picked up that economic land review, if, if you've seen the document library, you know, that was commissioned and started prior to COVID and we have just, you know, we are aware of that and that's caveated within it. And we are aware that we will need to do some further economic work, but what it will pick up on this question here. So regarding the questions asked, have you factored into this evidence what is happening to the city centre as this impacts the local plan and transport too? So the current evidence bases just haven't considered that at this second in time because they are prior to that. So, and we are aware and I have you know, communicated that this is, you know, the earliest stage findings. I mean, some of the evidence bases we didn't actually commission to, until after the issues and options consultation back in the earlier part of the year. So it is a very early piece of work. And we really need to start, you know, bringing some of these together. And there will be further studies that will no doubt need to be commissioned as we move forward. But also within the constraints of the timescales we have set within the local development scheme, um, in terms of when we're trying to meet different milestones within the plan making process to get a plan by the end of that, that period to take for examination. Um, anyone else wants to come in on any, any of those matters? I don't know if John, you would like to come in on any of them in particular relevant to you, no? Fine, let's move on. Let's keep on with the green belt. 
we have a very limited amount of green belt separating us from Cambridge. I'm very much in favour of limiting development in green belt in a group village, more efficiencies in new sustainable settlements. Our village plan 2018, only 5% of residents support development in our green belt. Is that acknowledged? Anna, do you want to pick this one up? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a really interesting one, actually, because in the consultation responses from the first conversation, we've had a really, really wide range of views on this. And that's something we're very mindful of moving forward. Um, obviously, the green belt, you know, is seen as very, very important. But we've also heard a range of views about where that might be um, balanced for some of the climate change considerations, for example. So that is a really interesting point. And I think we're going to be showing a few more of the implications of that actually in the slides coming up in a minute, which go through some of those locational options and, and possible locations in a bit more detail. I think we might should move on to those slides because I'm very aware of time actually. So I'm just going to hand back to John to go through some of those spatial options and then we'll pick up the rest of these questions after this next part of the presentation. So I'm just going to go through how we looked at some of the spatial options that are available and got some of that evidence base to test the pros and the cons and the issues and the opportunities about where we might locate future growth in the next local plan. Um, these options will be quite familiar if you read our first conversation consultation back in February. It really shows at that time what we thought the broad spatial choices were available to the new plan. Before we moved on to the next stage though, we wanted to check whether there were other ones we should be considering. This very broad level and early stage. And as you can see, having looked at over 97 ideas, 29 were shortlisted. We actually got down to two real broad spatial choices we felt weren't adequately covered at this point. And they were an additional uh, look at uh, integrating jobs and homes particularly in the southern part of Cambridge, where we've got uh, another um, a number of local uh, business parks, Granter Park, Welcome and so on, whether that might be a choice where you locate homes. And then on the western side of Cambridge, particularly with transport infrastructure being looked at and East West Rail potentially delivering a railway station at Camborne, whether one option we should be exploring in more detail was further growth on that particular corridor. Having come up with those options, effectively we allocated the numbers of homes we were testing, as we talked about earlier, to make sure we had 24 spatial strategy options with the same number in them. So three, three different growth levels of medium, um, maximum, minimum, uh, and then the eight with a same growth in each, each of those sets to make sure we were testing the same. And they were very focused on to those spatial choices. In some cases, we had to then bring in other spatial areas to make up the numbers. And I'll, I'll explain that a bit further. Um, they're quite clear choice at this point. You might think they're very clear and, and very focused on a particular choice. That was really deliberate because we really want to be able to identify the pros and cons. The plan at the end could take elements for a number of them, but this is really a testing phase. So running through these spatial choices very quickly, the first one I mentioned was identification approach. And this one was really aimed at testing the idea of what if you try and focus development into existing urban areas. And as you can see, for the minimum option, we tested putting the homes into the existing urban area and highlighted some of the pros and cons of doing that. For example, the focused options in urban areas means you get good access to transport and so on, but have some challenges about building in existing areas um, that you would have to overcome. And then as we go through Towards the medium growth, clearly you'd need to put additional growth in your very focused option and bring in further sites such as the airport site. And in the maximum, we know we would need to deliver additional growth again, but perhaps deliver some of our existing sites faster to make out some of the numbers, but that would bring challenges as acknowledged on the slide. And then as we picked up in that question, Edge of Cambridge non-Greenbelt, the two options really focused on here are Northeast Cambridge and Cambridge Airport. So it'd be about delivering homes in that area, which again comes with pros and cons in the options. And then for the medium, uh, we'd need to bring in some additional growth. So in this case, to, to make the testing work, we brought in some additional growth at new settlements. And in the maximum, it was all about building those sites out faster 
with additional growth again. So you can see building up a pattern of testing those options to really highlight those pros and cons. And then to explore an option of whether we should be releasing further land from the green belt on the edge of the city. Clearly we focused our minimum growth on what would happen if we had additional green belt releases to meet that growth. And then in the medium option, it was even more growth, so clearly that being bigger impacts such as landscape and townscape impacts and so on than the, me than the minimum. And then again, for the maximum, it'd be bringing those sites forward quicker if you can manage to do that and further growth at new settlements again. Um, and then the new settlements option here, very similar, new settlements on transport corridors would be the focus of this option. And then going through the medium, you would need to have uh, further new settlements and at the maximum, it would need to be delivering those faster. And again, new settlements bring uh, some benefits in terms of having that clean slate to deliver new infrastructure in a very focused manner. But equally, that can be challenging because you can't rely on existing infrastructure. You need, you need that to support their early growth. So it's real pros and cons there. And then we had an option looking at villages. This one's a bit, um, what it says on the tin, because you can see from this option, we decided to test what would happen if you distributed growth across the existing villages uh, in the area. So you can see a very scattered pattern there on that map. That brings a lot of challenges because in many cases, these village options where you focus growth in a very scattered manner perform worse in terms of their impact on carbon and infrastructure delivery and so on. And those patterns were really emphasized as you went through the medium and the maximum, where as you can see, we simply increased the number of uh, developments in those areas for testing. And then we, almost had almost a hybrid option here where we thought well if you're going to really focus on transport corridors you might do a combination of further new settlements but also growing the villages that are going to benefit from those transport links um, and as you can see we built that picture up again through the medium and the maximum as well so there's two extra options we looked at uh, that i'd mentioned the southern cluster option would again be a hybrid option where you perhaps needed a new settlement, but also you focus additional growth at existing villages near to those employment areas. And again, building up would be further growth in those villages and at the new settlement and through to the maximum. You might need to bring in additional sites, additional locations to make up the numbers to make that a practical option for testing at this stage. And on the western corridor, very similar approach where you might have further growth based on new settlement and growth at the villages on that transport corridor. And then to do that testing process, increasing the growth through the medium and then towards the maximum having additional effects. So as you'll have seen, they are quite stark and they really do focus growth to try and enable us to really pour over those pros and cons and issues and opportunities to inform our decision making as we start to develop that preferred approach to the plan. And all the evidence-based pieces that we've published alongside that really then start to probe what those pros and cons are. And you can find all the evidence on our website. Thank you very much, John. So we're into the final part. So we've got about 20 minutes left for Q&A. So please do get your questions in because we've only got six in there at the moment. I just want to introduce Stephen Kelly, who's joined the panel. So you want to introduce yourself, Stephen? Thank you, Paul. Good evening, everybody. Sorry I couldn't join you at the, at the beginning. I've, I've noticed the questions, really interesting uh, questions, and we hope the answers are uh, helpful uh, to you. Clearly, at the stage of the plan that we're at at the moment, um, uh, some of these matters uh, are work in progress uh, rather than necessarily definitive, but um, really interesting line of questions so far, and, and um, I'm sure the team are an anxious to answer further, so I'll be quiet. Thank you very much, Stephen. So let's start going through some questions then. Um, is it worth having faster review cycles in our particular dramatic changes anticipated in over the next few years, post-Brexit, post-COVID? So I'm going to give this one to Caroline and others can come in on it if we want to have a bit of a discussion around it too. Well, government is really keen that local authorities do review their plans on a regular cycle anyway, as I think we mentioned earlier, on a at least every five years. 
um, we've committed to undertaking an early review of our adopted plans and it's really important that we we keep moving forwards with with this plan um, but we will certainly be keeping under review thing you know changes that happen during this plan making process and it's always possible that when you monitor you monitor a plan once you've adopted it and if there are reasons to make changes you can make partial changes to plans as well as full blown comprehensive reviews. So that's very much something that we can and, and, and will keep under review as we move forwards. Thanks, Caroline. Um, I'm gonna move on to, would you consider incorporating in a new local plan, developing further eco housing developments like Marmalade Lane in Orchard Park, uh, Cambridge? Stephen, I think that you're keen to pick this one up. So I'm gonna pass this one to you. Uh, thanks, Paul. Um, just very briefly, well, I think the work that John um, has been leading on uh, looking at net zero carbon actually means that I'm sure that uh, eco homes and passive house type developments will be an important part of the spatial strategy heading uh, towards the, the plan uh, through the plan period. Um, but um, uh, John, I don't know whether you want to comment on any um, uh, further on the work that we've done around net zero carbon and its implications, but I encourage everyone uh, on the call to, to look at it. Yeah, absolutely stress that study is really only an initial phase of that work and they are very much looking at what standards we might need to include and we'll also need to feed that through all the evidence evidence bases. So what implications it had for the, the uh, viability of science, for example. So there's a lot of work to do that we're still bringing forward in those studies. Thanks both. Um, I'm going to pick one up on a, a pretty live subject nationally at the moment. So also government algorithm is going to be adjusted to avoid favouritism of the southern and the eastern regions. And we've had a little bit of thought around this. So I'm going to ask Stuart Morris to pick this one up. Stuart. Thanks Paul. Um, obviously there's been a lot of news about algorithms generally this year and uh, last. I guess it's possibly worth noting that uh, this algorithm is, is really a fairly simple calculation for determining our minimum housing need, um, which takes into account past population growth and adjusts for affordability challenges. And the favoritism that's come out in the news um, about South and Southeast, uh, to my understanding, reflects those affordability challenges that you see in this area and in the Southeast. There was this consultation on a revised version that sought to place greater weight on the change in affordability over the last 10 years. And for us, that suggested it might lower the figure. Um, but now there's been clearly uh, significant uh, negative uh, responses to that suggestion. We don't know where that's going to go right now. Cheers, Stuart. OK, next one. What is the likely demand for new employment land? I'm going to go to John for this one. Stephen, you might want to dip in too. Well, I think uh, the answer to this one is set out uh, in the study. Uh, we've published an employment land review study, which you can find on our website. And some of that findings are that we have got a strong supply of existing employment land. Um, but it does say there are certain, certainly some quantitative, but also qualitative issues that need to be addressed in that supply. So, for example, it certainly highlights we might need some further space for small sort of warehousing because we're all perhaps using online services more than we, we did a number of years ago. It also picks up some issues like there might be certain types, even with the high tech industries that aren't being um, have sufficient space for like like um, wet labs, which are a particular type of lab they use in uh, life sciences. So. Um, there is still need for certain types of employment, but a good supply out there. And if, if you want to look at the detail, please go to the study. Yeah, and we will highlight you to this, the website as well afterwards where the studies are all there. They are in one single document library. They should be reasonably easy to find, but we can always help with that. I'm going to move to a transport question now. Um, when can we expect to study into the impact of these options on traffic density in Cambridge? At times, we are close to gridlocks now in some areas and pollution exceeds permissible levels at some times of day. So Caroline's leading on the transport. Caroline? Yeah, thanks, Paul. You're breaking up a bit, but um, yes, I'm happy to take that one. Um, we, we've started some initial work on transport modelling of the different spatial options that we, we, we've tested. 
Um, that's to understand um, both the overall traffic implications um, and, and, and also how different spatial options perform in terms of how attractive they are to get people out of their cars, actually, because a lot of what we, you know, we, we all want to see moving forward is that um, uh, we, we, we work, uh, use more sustainable forms of travel. So a lot of it is also around um, how accessible uh, different spatial options are by, by active modes, so cycling and walking, but also by forms of public transport too. Uh, and that will very much continue as we move through the process of, I, uh, of moving towards a preferred option and making sure that we understand uh, if there are transport mitigation measures needed to improve and deal with the impact of, of, of traffic that, uh, that they're something we require through the plan. I think the other thing I would just say around the pollution part of that question um, is that uh, both pollution but also the emission side of thing is, is really important and as John was saying in the zero carbon evidence it's really helpful to us to start to try and get a sense of actually how different the different spatial strategies are you know we've always known that if if, if there's a higher level of bus use uh, or whatever that's likely to be better in terms of its estate its sustainability and its, and its emissions and impact but we're through this quite innovative um, study, we're trying to get um, a more of a quantitative um, idea and understanding of those different choices. So that can feed into our consideration as we move towards preferred strategy. Thanks very much, Caroline. I'm gonna pick up one question around zero carbon because it's a quick one, and then I'm gonna move on to an interesting one about brownfield land. So the, can we confirm the zero carbon is zero from the construction as well as, as the lifetime um, of the property? And I think that it picks up the, the zero carbon study is actually a really um, kind of innovative piece really because it's quite new in terms of what it's actually trying to achieve and it does pick up the in, embodied carbon and, and profiles a lot of those with some of the modelling in it. I would encourage, it's, it's actually quite an easy report to read, it's, it's got some technical stuff in there but it's actually pretty clear and the summary has some really good discussion points in it so um, yes is the answer to that. Um, I'm going to move to the brownfield site question. There is a large brownfield site. The service car parks are used for Newmarket Road retail park. These could house 2,000 people if developed. Car parking could still be provided as basement or ground floor parking flats above. A similar development was carried out in Gateshead 2016. Can the council encourage this type of development to come forward? Uh, Stephen, do you want to pick this one up? Uh, thanks, Paul. Yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, obviously, the site in question was was uh, previously developed land, and um, I'm aware uh, has some uh, ground condition issues with it. But 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 certainly, the work that we'll be doing, we'll be thinking quite hard about sites like this, particularly in the context of other questions that people have asked about the future of retailing and and so on. Uh, and and actually, just to broaden a, a number of these a bracket, a number of these questions together. One of the things that um, I hope people understand as they look through the evidence is how a number of these issues are all interrelated and that we are looking at them together. So, for example, the point around employment land uh, and where it is and the concerns about commuting and travelling to work alongside things like biodiversity and the, uh, and the implications for carbon uh, are all... Um, are not separate pieces of work, but certainly they're informing some of the ways in which um, hopefully you can see we've, we're starting to assess the spatial options. So um, absolutely in terms of uh, New Market Road, uh, obviously the landowners haven't, I don't think, submitted those sites for the call for sites, but that doesn't stop the planning authority from exploring what uh, the future might mean for sites like that as we go forward looking for um, sustainable ways to grow uh, Greater Cambridge. Thank you very much, Stephen. Okay, next one. Um, it should be noted, Groves, as an example, bought Greenbelt farmland, which is now being proposed for building upon in Trumpington, even when homes built and the issues in this area remain unresolved. It's more of a comment, really, but I think it's worth touching on. Do you want to pick that one up, uh, Caroline? Sorry. Oh, my Wi Fi is dropping out. I do apologise. Well, I think it's it, it's interesting, isn't it? So there are an awful lot of landowners and developer interests in in this part of the world. Um, we published the results of our call for sites uh, in September, and we've had 
well over 600 sites already submitted to us. So there's a, and they, and they range from very large sites on the edge of Cambridge to new settlements to, to village sites. Um, and we will be looking at, uh, at, at all of those. Um, at this stage, they don't have any status. And, you know, we will go through the process of assessing them and identifying the most appropriate sites moving forward. But um, I suppose it is worth saying that, you know, we have to be clear that the sites that we put into our plan are capable of being delivered um, and, and um, having willing and able um, promoters is, is not a bad thing as a, you know, as a matter of principle, but what we have to do is to make sure we take from the, be the best sites that are most appropriate for our strategy to include in our plan. Thank you very much, Caroline. Um, so I've got a question, I've got two, no, let me just do this one first, I think. How do you correlate what is being said about the local plan and transport schemes currently going through consultation? SQL prioritised transport schemes, SQL, just to let you all know, are some of the consultants who helped prepare the GL Herm report on our economic modelling, um, and they worked on Cambridge Ahead modelling um, on the government's city deal funding for these schemes along with GL Hearn, who are a real estate consultancy. So I think the question is, how do we correlate the work that the transport and economic work was being done by the same consultants? Do you want to pick up on this one, Stephen? Uh, I'm happy to, to um, uh, address it. Um, uh, there's, there's two elements to the questions, I, su I suppose. The first is, um, we have, we have worked with a set of assumptions from the transport strategy that uh, was associated with the last local plan in starting in both uh, looking at the performance of existing spatial options, but also in thinking around what that strategy, which of course will continue through to 2030 and beyond in terms of its current site allocations, means for infrastructure requirements. There is further work that's going to be uh, undertaken uh, on transport for this plan. Uh, including starting to try and think about some of the potential implications from uh, uh, shifts in behaviour and, and movement, as we've said earlier. I think if there's a concern about the um, being expressed in the question about the um, provenance of the work, the reassurance in many respects, regardless of who the consultancy is or who it is who is preparing the work, uh, is that uh, we have a we have a, a, a competent and um, extensive team in Greater Cambridge working on these issues who are uh, working for you effectively. They're uh, all part of the local planning authority, and of course, all decisions of mem uh, of the service on the local plan will be informed by members. Um, is it? Uh, do I apologise for using experts in real estate to give us advice around real estate issues? No. Um, we need people who are in tune with and understand the market because of the tests around delivery. We do want to produce a plan for you which has the best evidence uh, in the best possible way. Um, there's a process for independently challenging that at examination. Uh, but um, if we're to de develop a plan that is deliverable, uh, which is important uh, as we look ahead, then we need to use experts and that involves working with the property industry, with specialists, uh, and those who have experience and track record in delivery. But the decisions are made by uh, your officers working with members and ultimately are signed off by the council through full council elections. Thank you very much, Stephen. And just to say, I think it's one of the things that we've talked about a little bit before. I think the term consultants often gets lost in translation because essentially the work that we are doing are studies. They're studies based, they're research based, they're empirical pieces of research. Um, and actually, you know, they're working through consultancy firms, but it's um, maybe something we can do and explain on at some point. I think we have talked about it to give some clarity there. Um, so how do these fit in? So I'm assuming the plan that we're talking about now fit in with the CAMS, Peterborough Combined Authority work plan. And Caroline, I think I'll come back to you on that. You're doing some of the strategy work. Thanks, Paul. Well, we have... Um... Uh, as part of our plan preparation process, um, it's important that we, we uh, engage with a, a wide range of interests and that very much includes the combined authority um, uh, under our duty to cooperate. So we engage with our neighbours, we engage with the combined authority, county council and, and, and a range of others. Um, 
uh, we very much mindful of the, um, the, the plans that the combined authority may have to bring forward their own uh, strategy for the wider area and we will continue to work with them as we develop our plans in a, you know, in, in a cooperative manner. Thanks very much, Caroline. I'm, I'm being viewed that we've got a few, only a few minutes left, and I don't see any reason why we can't get these clinic questions um, finished on here. I'm going to go with this one. On a scale of one to ten, how confident are you that any development will not further degrade or damage or already vulnerable local chalk streams? Um, there's many people who probably want to answer this question. I'll, I'll say myself, I think that we try not to work on the basis of being confident. We are working from the basis of evidence. And actually, that is the main point, because as we've all said in this process before, this is an independently examined process at the end and is, is, is examined by the Secretary of State as we get through to it. So we have to have done um, everything and dotted all the I's and crossed all the T's. I nearly got that the wrong way around. I don't know if anyone else wants to say anything on that particular item, maybe John? That would be linked to another question that's actually come in later on. I think, well, it, the study we've published really is only an interim stage. Uh, the full water cycle strategy will now be in production, and we will be looking to see what that can do to provide the certainty about how water supplies will be addressed going forward. I guess the other issue is clearly we are working with other stakeholders in water. So, for example, Water, Resis water Resources East, who are also producing uh, a, a plan for how they consider water resources can be addressed. Uh, across the, the region. They're going to be consulting on a draft plan next year, so we'll very much be wanting to work with them. So there, we're working that our growth levels we're planning for are aligned with the plans they're doing to look at how water can be delivered sustainably. Thanks very much, John. Um, okay, moving into this one, this looks an interesting one. When looking at other countries, also recent discussion with emissions air quality, would Cambridge consider the move to a Swiss style non-ICE cities with all the last three miles delivered by non-emitting vehicles, bikes, and increasing process of metro, tram, bus, or public movement. I'm sure that quite a few people would like to answer. I'm going to give it to you, Hannah, first, because I'm sure you're interested in this one, and others can get involved as well. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a really interesting one, and, and we've explored a lot of this, actually, as part of the North East Cambridge Area Action Plan consultation recently, um, where we have looked at, essentially, that last mile delivery question in quite a bit of detail. Cambridge does lead on a lot of this, because we already have cargo bike deliveries and so forth happening in the city, which is really fantastic. Um, so, you know, it, it's something that we are looking at very seriously and trying to really have that, that last mile um, approach, looking at delivery hubs, for instance, where by you consolidate the deliveries into a specific hub from which they can then go either people can pick them up for themselves by their own bikes or by foot or they can be delivered by bike um, and also all of that transport that we've sort of touched on across the wider region with all the other public transport schemes here I think it's a really interesting one because it comes to that point about carbon emissions and transport fundamentally that's really fine for locations that are really compact and really well located in terms of accessibility. Clearly in more fringe or rural locations that can be really challenging. One of the things we're aware of is the transport emissions associated with development and not just people going to work, they're also people going to the shops, picking up their deliveries, going to school, going to the doctors, doing all the other things in daily life. So we have to make sure that we're sustainable from one of those aspects of transport, not just looking at the commuting. Thanks, Hannah. Um, considering the transport plans, are you taking account of Mayor's proposals for the Northern Road route as opposed to the current GCP route? Still not settled. Would the Northern Corridor north of the A428 be a better place to pick up the larger developments in the, in offered west of Cambridge? I don't know, Stephen, you want to pick up on that or Caroline? Uh, thanks, thanks, Paul. Uh, obviously, at this moment in time, in terms of the work that we're doing around spatial options, um, the transport modelling is uh, will be subject to sensitivity testing, looking at the implications of the CAM, but it isn't at this stage at a fine grain level where it relates to specific alignments. Um, so it's not going to be, um, I, I don't think it's a point of detail at this moment in time for this part of the plan uh, making, making process. Um, uh, Caroline may well wish to comment in terms of the transport modelling work to date, but um, uh, that's my understanding. Uh, simply to confirm that the transport modelling assumes a high quality public transport 
connection along that corridor similar to the GCP proposals, but it's not route specific at this point in the process. Can you mute? Maybe we started on mute there. Um, so there's a few more in there. A lot of them are just statements. Um, I'm just trying to have a look to see if there's anything that. While you're looking, Paul, I'm just going to show the next step slide so that people yeah. are aware of what happens yeah, after this point in time. Um, so just as we've touched on um, this, we've published all of this evidence. It's all on the website address. I'll show you in a minute. But we also have a lot more evidence coming. Um, so by no means is this it. A lot of these, as has been mentioned, are also interim studies. So for instance, the water cycle study, that is a very large and ongoing and complex study, which is only part way through at the moment. And some of these other studies, we haven't published anything really on yet. So you can look out for them uh, next year when we go into and towards the preferred options consultation. As just a reminder of that time scales, we're looking at that, which will be a very full public consultation and we hope um, we'll be able to do face-to-face -face events again at some point next year as part of that. Um, so those are the processes. The preferred option is actually an extra stage to the local plan that we have put in. Um, we're not required to do that stage by the national regulations but we reviewed earlier this year and we felt that as such a large and complex plan it was important that we did add that extra stage of consultation. We'll review those findings, we'll do more engagement as part of that, and then we will have the draft local plan, so there'll be another full opportunity for everybody to comment on the plan in terms of consultation before we then finalise it for the proposed submission plan, which again also has more public consultations, so there are many, many stages where everybody can get involved, share their views, and we will take all of those comments on board. And, and most importantly, each of those comes with a consultation statement, which actually will tell you how we've taken those comments on board and how they've influenced the shape of the plan going forward. So those are the website, that's the website address. And if you go to that website address and find the document library, which is linked to there, all of the documents we've referred to this evening are listed and, and readable there. And if you have any queries, that's the email address to contact us on, and we will answer those as quickly as we can. Paul, do you want to click up on a few last questions while I just leave that up? Yeah, I think we'll just maybe take, take two more questions off of here, because I think that there's only two that I can see that are actually probably questions. Um, good to know what consideration is taken in terms of judging developer landowner can deliver on their proposal. Trumping in as an area of police reports has become one of the worst three wards. Do not cite this as planners' fault, thank you. <laughs> but the developers have approved uh, the, the developers approved are not held to account. How can this be developed with planning reviews such as local plan and deciding which sites to engage with? Um, Stephen, I'm going to pass that one to you. If you've got some comments on that, probably myself. I think the whole part. Thank you, Paul. Uh, I mean, it, it, it is it is a. Uh, a challenge that planning can't fix everything um, and one of the things that uh, but one of the things that I think go hand in glove with the definition of quality development is thinking around quality implementation um, by the partners that uh, get involved in the development process so we are um, trying to give some thought about quality standards and indeed um, whilst it's difficult uh, that the planning process can't put a policy in about which developers develop which sites um, I, I expect that there will be further exploration of things around the management of sites, the effective curating of place, not least because of the complexity of achieving things like net zero carbon uh, and the new infrastructure associated with um, public realm and the management of public realm, as well as vehicle charging, etc. that's going to need to be put in place for some of those newer uh, schemes coming forwards. So I haven't got an answer for it right now. Um, obviously, one always hopes that um, that the uh, good publicity available online uh, helps people to make informed choices about their future uh, their future purchase. Um, and um, we are aware of some of those challenges. Uh, whether or not me and the planning team can solve the behaviour of some of the developers is is probably questionable on our own. Um, I think working together, we might want to think about that further. Thank you. Thanks. I'll just do one last really quick one. I know we've gone over quite a bit, but I think then we've covered pretty much most of those things off. I've got a question around the water resources east consultation. I'm not sure this is one we can necessarily answer as well, but it was raised yesterday. So will there be an official consultation on the regional water plan from water resources east? Um, Stephen or Carolyn, I'm not sure whether you know that at this stage. I don't think we know specifically. 
So I would, I would, they have a very comprehensive website which sets out their timetable and what they're planning in terms of preparing that particular plan. I noticed also in the questions there was a, a point about whether there's an independent review process, just to point out that uh, our particular study was subject to an independent academic review and you can find a summary of that process in the document on our webpage. Yeah, and I think that will be continuing throughout the study as we go forward. Uh, Paul, can, I, can I just comment, because there's a question that's popped in at the end about um, the status of Water Resources East. Um, Jonathan, I don't know if you can um, add anything to it, but my understanding is, is that in terms of the question who has appointed them, the government have identified that actually water resort, regional water resource management plans should happen through these bodies. Uh, and, uh, you know, please be reassured, as Jonathan's highlighted, that the independent review that we're, uh, that we've built into our process uh, does at least seek to make sure that the um, strategy that will come out from Water Resources East next summer is, is robustly um, tested and considered by ourselves, as we also seek to engage with some of the issues around infrastructure delivery uh, uh, on water and related matters. Yeah. Absolutely. So I think I'd like to start to thank all of the team for being here today, but I'd like to thank all of you for coming and some really, really good questions tonight. And I hope that we've been able to answer some of the concerns or issues that you have. Um, as I'm going to put up with the slide, the website has, please remember it is an interim stage. And there is also a website where you, uh, sorry, an email address where you can get hold of the team. Um, but otherwise, I hope you have a lovely evening and thank you all for attending and we'll see you again soon.